1927, Universal Pictures wanted to get into the cartoon business. Tired of technical restrictions of working on existing properties, Charles Mintz tasked Ub Iwerks and Walt Disney to create an original new character. This character would change Iwerks and Disney's lives forever. His name was Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. After Universal rejected the first Oswald feature, the duo created a second cartoon starring the Lucky Rabbit that became an instant hit. After a bunch of successful features, Disney and Iwerks ended their relationship with Mintz and Universal in order to retain the rights to their characters as well as their full paychecks. They went on to create Mickey Mouse and Oswald the Lucky Rabbit was eclipsed almost immediately. But what happens to a character when they're left behind? Do they remain completely forgotten or is there a remnant of them somewhere out there? Disney's Epic Mickey banks on the ladder. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. And if you want to contribute to the work that we do and the games that I complete here on the show, you absolutely can through our Patreon mini producer tier. The link for that is in the box down below. In fact, it's because of our many producers over on Patreon that we're covering Disney's Epic Mickey for today's episode. The folks over there nominated this game for me to complete, and honestly, I couldn't be happier. I absolutely love everything Disney, and when I first saw the insane leaked concept art back in 2009, I was pumped. Not to mention, the director of the game was the creator of Deus Ex. I could hear that hype train coming a mile away. But the problem with hype is that it raises expectations, right? And those expectations are raised even more when you put the word epic in your title. So let's take a look at which parts are riding that hype train and which ones are stuck in the caboose. Let's begin. Yes! All glory goes to the winner. Even though Epic Mickey came out in 2010, the original concept actually came about much earlier. Creative development at Buena Vista Games came up with the idea and pitched a Mickey Mouse vs. Oswald game to then Disney COO Bob Iger. Now, he loved the idea, but Disney didn't own the rights to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Universal did. That's right, it had been about 80 years and Universal Pictures still owned the rights to Walt Disney's first original character. So Iger made it a personal goal to get Oswald back under that Disney banner. So Iger did what he does best, he struck a deal. Iger offered a trade. Disney would get the rights for Oswald and in return, NBC Universal would get sports commentator and the actual human Al Michaels. That's right folks, Bob Iger traded an actual human being for a character that barely anyone remembered at the time. This baffled a lot of people, but one person thought this was a great idea, Al Michaels. Around the same time, the Kansas City Chiefs and the New York Jets made a similar deal, trading a draft pick for coach Herman Edwards. Michael said, Oswald is definitely worth more than a fourth round draft choice. I'm going to be a trivia answer someday. And this, my friends, is the most football talk you're ever going to get in one of my videos. Epic Mickey didn't just represent an important moment in Disney history, it also looked like it was going to be an important moment in gaming history. The most famous company in the world was taking a huge risk to make a game with an epic story and an insanely different look from what they usually put out. And Disney just didn't do that. Other than Kingdom Hearts, most Disney games were just seen as licensed games that ranged from bad to mediocre. Yeah, they had some great platformers on the Super Nintendo, but almost every game from then on was an awful interpretation of a film or a cheap knockoff of a popular gaming trend. Except for Disney Extreme Skate Adventure, that game was genuinely awesome. And it was the same for Wii games. Epic Mickey released towards the end of the Nintendo Wii's life cycle. So 
so most of the games around were just shovelware. Yeah, of course we had Super Mario Galaxy that came out that same year, but so did Titanic Mystery, Satisfaction, and Calvin Tucker's Redneck Farm Animals Racing Tournament. Epic Mickey was a lighthouse shining a light in a sea of mediocrity, and fans were very excited for it. Now this was mostly because of the absolutely insane concept art that was leaked years before the game came out. So what do I mean by insane concept art? Well, take a look at this. That stuff was pretty freaking creepy. It basically looked like if H.R. Geiger and David Cronenberg got to direct their own Disney film. And you can just imagine what the public reaction was to that. Imagine if someone came up to you and pitched Human Centipede with Mickey Mouse and Abraham Lincoln today. Except that was also one of the early concept art too. Naturally, when you see something this crazy, you gotta be a little hyped for it. Before Epic Mickey was released, consumers knew two things about it. It was going to be really, really dark, and it would be a battle against Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and Mickey Mouse. Only it wasn't, and it wasn't. This concept art was never supposed to be released. According to famous game director Warren Spector, these were meant to test the waters with the Disney company to see what they would be comfortable with and vice versa. And the best way to do that was to cross the line by a lot. Like, a lot. So while it was super disappointing we didn't get the terrifying Geigerland game we all wanted, that wasn't the original vision of the game. It was the game's creators seeing what they could get away with. And what they eventually got away with is still pretty disturbing. Remember that goofy animatronic zombie thing I showed earlier? That actually made it into the game amongst other disturbing animatronic characters. And each level design is based on the different areas of Disneyland, except they're all run down and based on Oswald instead of Mickey. So for example, on Main Street, you can see that famous statue of Walt Disney holding Mickey's hand, but with Oswald instead, which brings me to the story. Epic Mickey isn't a game about Oswald getting his revenge on Mickey. It's a game about grief and taking responsibility for one's actions, although it took me a while to realize that. The game starts off with a cutscene where Mickey Mouse travels through his mirror and sees Yen Sid painting a map with a magical brush, because if something magical happens in a Disney property, it's gotta be done by Yen Sid. Yen Sid leaves, and Mickey decides to try his hand at painting the map. Mickey accidentally mixes up the paint and paint thinner, causing them to create an evil creature called the Blot. They briefly battle and Mickey escapes back through the mirror just as Dumbledore returns. Cut to many years later and Mickey is the most successful cartoon ever. The blot is still around however and reaches through that mirror and drags Mickey back into the map. But Mickey grabs Gandalf's brush along the way. Mickey is knocked unconscious and wakes up strapped to a wooden table where the mad doctor is trying to remove his heart. Oswald is there and accidentally breaks the machine causing the mad doctor to leave. The machine goes haywire, and Gremlin Gus tries to save Mickey. So, are you confused yet? Because I sure as hell was. There is a ton of stuff thrown at you here in the first seven minutes, and almost none of it is necessary. Yen Sid only serves as a narrator for the opening and ending cutscenes. The Mad Doctor's background is never really explained in the game and only serves as a boss in a later level. What's important to focus on is that Mickey created the plot and Oswald doesn't like Mickey Mouse. The way Oswald sees it, he was abandoned by Walt after Walt created Mickey. And everything that has been cast aside to the rivers of time eventually winds up in this spot. Oswald created this whole world as a utopia for all of the characters and things that have been completely forgotten by Disney. That's why you run into Horace Horsecollar and Clarabella Cow as cartoons, and why there is a mountain literally made out of all of the Mickey junk thrown away decades ago. But everything was destroyed once the plot arrived, which is why the whole world is in such disarray. However, Mickey won't tell Oswald that he was the one who created the blot. Mickey already created enough trauma for the rabbit. Why create more? It makes the tension between these two characters so much more interesting. If you ask me, this should have been the main focus of the entire opening cutscene. Plot is made up of things happening in sequence. 
Story is created by characters, their relationship with each other, and the choices they make based on those relationships. Mickey and Oswald's relationship is really compelling. I want them to help heal each other and become friends. And while I do love this character dynamic, what I really love is the amount of nostalgia that's in this game. Now, I freaking love Disney, which is a good reason to play this game alone. Almost everything in this game is a nod to the wonderful world of Disney before 1967. This is because Warren Spector is not only a brilliant game director, but a huge Disney fan as well. It's because of this that there are so many details in Epic Mickey that are executed perfectly. Epic Mickey looks insane for a Wii game. Things like drops of ink floating off of Mickey's body or the Toontown sign broken to spell out Oztown instead make this world feel alive. Every single item seen in the aforementioned Mickey Junk Mountain is something that children would have owned at the time. Oh, and the layout of Mean Street is the same as Disneyland's Main Street. I could literally go on for hours about all of the cool nostalgic details in this game. Even the collectibles are a trip down memory lane. The main collectible is the different pins you get from treasure chests or as gifts from NPCs for doing side missions. These resemble the pins you can actually purchase at Disneyland. Most pins are just labeled bronze, silver, or gold, but some of them reflect events that occur in the story. Although I do wish all the pins had something like this, I still think this is a great tribute to the game and Disney as a whole. And then there are the e-tickets. While this serves as the main currency in the game, this also has some Disney history attached to it. See, way back in the day, you didn't pay admission to get into Disneyland. But if you wanted to get on the rides, you had to buy a ticket book with different tickets based on the excitement level of the rides. The most exciting rides needed the e-ticket. So when something exciting happens and a person in their 50s or older says, ooh, that's an e-ticket, you know what they mean now. Now we all know kind of the joke of the Nintendo Wii, right? The console is not as great as we'd hoped it would be with regards to the power of its console capabilities. Graphics, online, gameplay. However, Epic Mickey makes all this work to the best of its ability. The cutscenes look incredible too. While the first and final cutscenes are all CGI, most of the others are hand-drawn 2D animation, and it looks so good. The music is absolutely perfect. With a name like Epic Mickey, you expect two things. It's going to be epic, and it's going to feel like Disney. And the music really contributes to that. Every area has a beautiful ambient score, and the sounds are oh so satisfying. Composer James Dooley really did an incredible job. However, I do have one sound-based complaint. There is no voice acting in the game. Except for Yen Sid's narration of the opening and closing cutscenes, no one says anything. You watch these gorgeous 2D cutscenes and just hear singular grunts from the characters. I mean, come on guys, you're Disney. You have access to some of the most talented voice actors in the world that have been voicing your characters for decades. Let's use them here. And I can already hear some of you at home in the comments explaining that, well, that's because they're trying to represent those classic cartoons. But I really don't think that's the case here. These cutscenes are all in full color and have captions underneath them with the dialogue. They clearly wanted these characters to talk. So while it sucks that there's no voice acting, everything else here is fantastic. Although there was no proof for it, I did read online that Epic Mickey came out a year earlier than intended, so maybe that's where the voice acting went? Because otherwise, this is one of the most interesting games presentation-wise that Disney has ever produced. Looking at everything in Epic Mickey, from the music to the collectibles to the overall design in the game, you can see that there's clearly a lot of love here. You can see that these people really love Disney and that feeling is contagious. Look, I love Disney too. My friends and I all used to have annual passes that we'd use all the time. Granted, they no longer have them anymore because of the pandemic, but I plan to go back to Disneyland in the very near future. And I wanna share my love and passion and affinity of Disney with you guys right now, especially because of how much I appreciate every design aspect that this game has to offer. However, I'm about to say some really harsh things about Disney's Epic Mickey. I love Disney. However, I love video games even more, and I especially love platformers, which is why I am super sad to say that 
I don't think Epic Mickey is a good platformer, and this surprised me. Warren Spector has made great games in the past. Deus Ex is a legendary first-person RPG that allowed you to solve problems with multiple different solutions. Your choices actively affected what happened in the story and led to multiple different endings. And it was clear that he wanted to do something similar with Epic Mickey. Yet, Epic Mickey is a 3D platformer, and it may seem much easier to make this than a huge first-person action RPG, but they're still completely different beasts. However, I still had hope in the beginning. After the opening cutscene, Gremlin Gus helps you escape and shows you how to do all of your abilities. Okay quick tutorial. That's fine, I'm used to that. I prefer personally to learn on my own, but the Wiimote can get a little confusing, especially to kids, which is this game's key demographic. But then I noticed that Gus didn't go away. Gus stuck around for a long, long time. The opening tutorial section before you get to the main hub area took me two hours and 41 minutes to get through, which is about two hours and 26 minutes too long for a tutorial section. And the entire time, Gremlin Gus tells you every little thing you're supposed to do. Essentially, for lack of a better term, this is Fee from Skyward Sword, but you didn't get to choose when you listened to them. You had to sit there through every cutscene every single time. This got me super heated and frustrated right off the bat as I was starting the game. I already learned how the game worked, just let me play it. So I finally got through these tutorial levels and guess what? Gus was still there. This gremlin little mother stuck around for the entire game, stopping me from playing and telling me every single thing that I was supposed to do. And what was really awful about all of this was that if I only did what Gus was telling me to do, I would have missed everything this game had to offer. I would have missed side missions, cool nostalgic tidbits, and a bunch of the collectibles I needed for completion. I would check guides to make sure I didn't miss anything and they would often say, Gus is going to tell you to go here, do not listen to him. So my original thought process for all of this was that this was a game meant for children. So maybe they felt like they needed to do a lot more handholding than usual. Not only is that really talking down to the intended audience, but it's also not true. Warren Spector himself said that this was a game meant for everyone from small children to veteran gamers to Disney fanatics. If that's the case, then why not promote exploration? Why put something in there that pulls the player away from the coolest parts of the game? The gameplay itself is very basic. You have to play with a nunchuck, run around with the analog stick, jump with A, and swing the Wiimote to do a spin attack. Pretty simple, it works fine. There are games on the Nintendo Wii that are very similar with these control schemes. The gimmick of the game is that you can point the Wiimote at the screen and spray paint with the trigger of the Wiimote or paint thinner with the Z button on the nunchuck. Paint will fill in certain spots in order to make more platforms, while thinner does the opposite and can reveal hidden rooms. This can be pretty neat for platforming, but it also has some combat utility as well. You can use thinner to destroy enemies or paint to make them allies. While paint and thinner seem drastically different, they're really not and eventually achieve the same result. So, so far, this all sounds pretty good, right? Nothing too crazy, but a nice base to build the game around. Unfortunately, this is where the game gets the most frustrating because of its camera. This camera has got to be one of the worst cameras I've ever used. So first up, it's attached to the D-pad, making your momentum fully stop since you have to move your thumb off the jump button to use it. Second, it moves incredibly slow. So if you wanna see where you're going, you have to stop and wait for the camera to get to the proper view. Only if you did that, you'd wind up getting killed by the enemies or miss the jump entirely because the camera always happens to be at the worst possible angle to see what you're doing. So let's compare this camera to Super Mario 64. It's attached to a similar setup with the C buttons, right? However, 64 works well because the camera performs a quick 90 degree turn instead of a slow pan to the left or the right. This means I only have to stop for a moment as opposed to waiting to actually play the game. Almost every time I died was because I couldn't tell where I was jumping or I couldn't see an enemy coming from behind me since the camera was so close to Mickey Mouse. And I knew it was the camera doing this because the transition levels were still super fun. Every world has a transition level connecting them to the other worlds. These come in the form of a projector screen and are based on some classic Disney and Oswald cartoons from the 1920s and 30s. Once again, these are all awesome pieces of nostalgia and look and sound great. They're easy, fun, and short enough that you can play them multiple times. However, you will be playing these levels too many times 
if you do any of the side quests. You'll be going back and forth between the same few levels multiple times in rapid succession. That gets really boring really quickly and could have easily been solved by a prompt after you've collected the film reel inside the transition level, asking if you'd like to skip the stage. Throughout all of this, the fact remains that Epic Mickey ends up just being boring. When the gameplay is simple and I'm told what to do at every possible moment, I get kind of bored. When the camera is the thing that keeps killing me and not my own mistakes, I get frustrated. And this is especially true during a second playthrough. In Epic Mickey, you will have multiple moments where you have to choose to help or not help people around you. Most of these don't have an effect on anything, except maybe the NPCs will call you out for being a dickhead. However, there are a few moments where your choices could result in different paint or thinner endings, which are essentially good and bad choices. You can affect these based on how you choose to defeat the bosses and by finishing certain side quests. In the boss battles, you get the choice to heal the world with paint or dissolve the bosses with paint thinner. You know, that classic moral decision between healing and murdering that video games love to give players? The side missions are all over the place, assuming that you ignored Gus. These are mostly fetch quests that involve finding items in the level and returning them to a hub world. These, unfortunately, are very basic and boring, except for when it comes to the animatronic Disney characters. In three levels, you'll find the heads of animatronic Goofy, Daisy, and Donald. You have to find the rest of their body parts and put them back together. Now, this is fun because you actually get a cutscene and get to see the results of you helping them. This is a nice touch, especially since these are the only decisions that affect the good and bad endings respectively. Epic Mickey says your choices will change the course of the story, but that's not really the case here. There are nine choices that change based on whether you decide to be good or not. And while you help everyone else out to get some more pins, none of it really matters to the actual main plot. In my first playthrough, I went with paint and tried to get as many collectibles as possible and helped everyone in order to get every good ending at once. Afterwards, in my second playthrough, I went with thinner and didn't help a single person in order to get all of the bad endings. However, the main story didn't change at all. Playing the game again just felt even more boring since I already did pretty much everything. And now, everyone hates me instead of liking me. Epic Mickey may be a mishmash of different genres, but it is a collectathon platformer at heart. And when it comes to collecting things, it can actually be kind of fun. But that is only when you're exploring these cool worlds that Junction Point Studios created. Using thinner to find a secret room or paint to activate some gears in order to reach a ledge are really interesting. But the satisfaction goes away when everything feels like it's the same value every time. Take for example the 105 pins. There are three different kinds of pins bronze, silver, and gold. You'd think that gold was somehow more valuable than silver and bronze, but really, they're not. There is nothing discernibly different other than the game telling you that they are different. This was different with the main story pins because they each commemorated a moment in the story. The rest just feels random and tacked on. What about the other collectibles? Well, the 36 film reels are really easy to recover since they're found in the short transition levels. And if you get enough of those, you actually get access to two classic Disney cartoons. Now this is a very nice nostalgic touch, especially since it was probably a lot harder to find these when the game came out. And finally, there's the 50 pages of extra content. Now these are hidden throughout all the levels and actually feel rewarding to find. This is because each one actually unlocks art that you can go and check out in the main menu. And this is a nice reward too. If only the game felt satisfying to play and to unlock these things in the process. So I completed this game for about 22 hours in total across two playthroughs in order to make sure that I got every single collectible possible. The camera made platforming and combat incredibly frustrating, resulting in most of my 12 deaths. I was most satisfied with Epic Mickey when I was taking in the world, watching a cutscene, or just exploring. And exploring felt good in the moment because I got an immediate reward with the different collectibles. But that was with the first playthrough. In the second one, there was a lot less to collect and it felt even more boring than the first one through. Not to mention that all the characters hated me because I wasn't helping them. 
So then why did I even bother with the second playthrough if I'm going to get nothing from it except for more boredom? Well, there is the alternate ending, and it is exactly the same as the first ending except for a small part in the middle where instead of seeing how I helped various characters, I get to see how I harmed them. And that's not a good feeling at all. And what made it worse was learning that the bad endings were the canonical choices Mickey made for the game's sequel in Epic Mickey 2. That's right, there was a sequel and it is based on the Mickey Mouse that didn't help anyone and killed every single boss. Yes, I know they wanted to take Mickey Mouse back to his mischievous past, but is he really a murderer here? Whenever this game did anything to be a game, I lost interest in it. This was one of those rare situations where I liked a game a lot more before I actually sat down with it. However, there is one thing I want to highlight so that I don't end this video on a completely negative note. Okay, so if you ever go to Disneyland and you walk onto Main Street, you will see the firehouse. In the room above the firehouse, there is a nice curtain on it and there's a light on. That's Walt Disney's apartment. And when the park was first built, it was where Walt would go to rest and watch his dreams come to fruition. And that light has been on the apartment ever since he passed. And it is a sentimental spot for every cast member and super fan of Disney. If you go to Gremlin Marcus and give him 30 extra power sparks, the item required to access levels, it will unlock an extra room on Mean Street. And that room is Walt's apartment. It is that kind of attention to detail that I love about this game. Knowing how much Warren Spector and his team over at Junction Point Studios loved the IP they were working with makes me happy that this game even exists. I can't help but feel that Epic Mickey was meant for greatness, but was held back by the lack of time and budget. If Junction Point had that extra year, maybe they could have made a truly epic Disney game with no flaws. Instead, we got a game that kind of faltered and couldn't live up to the hype that it was made for itself. However, Spectre said that that was not the case here. Disney pretty much gave them free reign to do whatever they wanted, and they released the game that they wanted to make. But maybe that's what went wrong here. Maybe they needed someone to step in and say, do you really want a really polished 3D platformer? Or do you want an epic story where your decisions affect what happens in the game? Can you imagine how cool either of those games would have been? Instead, they tried to do both and unfortunately ended up kind of in the middle with nothing. Then again, that's just my opinion. There are people out there who love this game to death. Spectre himself says that this is the game he gets the most fan mail over. More than System Shock, more than Deus Ex. This is his most popular game he ever made and also his favorite. And while I personally didn't love the game as much as I wanted to, I really, really love the world that they created. That's why I implore you to seek out everything related to Epic Mickey that you can get your hands on. Look up that early concept art, read that graphic novel, listen to the soundtrack, and of course, watch some classic cartoons. But as far as the game goes, you can probably just end up playing Epic Mickey a little bit and making your own decision. So, that in mind guys, I give this game my completionist rating of play it.